Mayor Bernard Sanders of Burlington, Vermont, how does a socialist like yourself keep winning elections in a country we generally consider that has a two-party system? Well, I think we win in Burlington. I should point out that in Burlington, I am the mayor, and I've won on four occasions, but we have 13 people on our city council, our board of aldermen, and six of them are progressive. So it's not just me. We have probably the only strong three-party city in the United States of America. And I think the reason that we win and continue to win is that increasingly people are frustrated and angry about a two-party system which is dominated by big money and which does not pay attention to the needs of working people or elderly people or poor people. And I think if you talk common sense to the people and you say the government is supposed to represent the needs of those people who today are not getting a fair shake, you know what? They'll vote for you. And the problem that we have nationally in this country is that the two-party system dominated by big money uh, is not delivering for ordinary people, which is why people are giving up on the political process, why they're not voting, uh, and why there is a great deal of anger and frustration uh, at the political system as it now exists. How and why did this happen in Burlington? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I can't really tell you. I think in Burlington, what we did back in 1981 is we pointed out the inadequacies of the previous government, and we knocked on a lot of doors, and we talked common sense to the people. We articulated the issues that I believe were of concern to the people, and since I've been elected, we've continued to focus on those issues. We have said, and our view is, that government has the right to get involved in any area that makes sense. You don't get involved in areas where it doesn't make sense. Previously, we had not had youth programs. We really didn't have good arts programs. Uh, in terms of our waterfront development, we were too prone to give it over to wealthy people and condominium development rather than preserving it for ordinary people. So I think we just talked the issues to the people. We knocked on doors. We worked very hard. And lo and behold, people responded. And I think the message that I'd like to convey to people is that if you go out in your cities and in your towns and you talk common sense to the people, you can win. And we should not be overwhelmed or frightened by the powers of the Democratic and Republican parties. I don't believe that they really have a lot of grassroots support. I think that most people vote Democrat, they vote Republican, because they don't see any alternative. And it seems to me that the challenge of our time is to wake people up, is to go outside of the Democratic and Republican Party, to talk about the real issues, health care, the fact the growing gap between the rich and the poor in this country, the bipartisan foreign policy by which we spend $300 billion on military, while we cut back on programs for the elderly, health care, housing. Uh, I think if you ask people whether, I mean, just recently what's been coming up in terms of the congressional pay raise, here you have a Congress which is giving themselves a 50% pay raise, is proposing to do that when they haven't raised the minimum wage in 10 years, and they've cut back on a whole variety of programs for working people and poor people. So I think that what has to happen in communities around this country is articulate the issues, have the guts to stand up to the people who own your community, who dominate the two major parties, and you'd be surprised at the results you'll get. The other parties do talk about housing, they talk about health care, they talk about those issues. Tell me what makes your approach different. Well, I should point out that not only have I been elected mayor of Burlington four times, I recently ran for, for Congress in, in November, and I lost the election. But in doing so, we put together a really very exciting campaign. We had 500 volunteers, we had 2,300 Vermonters contributing to the campaign, and I lost. The fellow who won, Peter Smith, got 41 percent, I got 38 percent, and the Democrat came in third with uh, 18 percent. And what it showed, it seemed to me, is that at least in Vermont, people are prepared to go beyond the labels of Democrat and Republican and respond to a call for radical change in this country. So what are the issues? We talk about housing. Well, the issue in terms of housing, the issue in terms of health care are not complicated. In terms of health care, the United States of America today is one of two industrialized nations in the world that does not have in one form or another a national health care system which guarantees health care to all of its people without out-of-pocket expenses. The other nation that has lacks a national health care system is South Africa, which tells us that we might want to think about moving in a different direction. All right. And the issue in terms of health care, very important issue, and I talk about it a lot in Vermont. Should the health care system be run as it presently is, basically to guarantee significant profits to the drug companies, to the hospitals, to the medical equipment suppliers, to the insurance companies, or should we try to provide the best quality of health care that we can, including a lot of preventative health care, in a nonprofit type of way? Okay. We live in Burlington, 50 miles away from Canada. In Canada today, you have a conservative government 
that has no desire whatsoever to touch in any way the national health care system that they have because they'd be thrown out of office if they did that. Now, if Canada, a poorer country, can provide health care to all of its people, why can't we do that in the United States of America? And I think the answer is that neither the Democratic or Republican Party has the guts to stand up to the medical industrial complex, which is a very powerful group of people. Our topic tonight is third party politics, and our guest is Bernard Sanders, a veteran mayor from Burlington, Vermont. He is a member of the Socialist Progressive Coalition Party, technically. Progressive Coalition. Progressive Coalition. Yeah. Uh, you are, uh, as you mentioned earlier, you're currently serving your fourth two-year term, and this will be your last term. Yes. And you're the only Socialist mayor in the United States. Prior to the election, he was a historian, writer, and film producer. And from 1976 to 1981, he was director of the American People's Historical Society. Could you tell us a little bit about the society? Well, what we did is we produced um, audiovisual material on state histories for kids. And we also got around to producing a very nice television program on the life of Eugene Debs, who, as you may know, was the uh, founder of the Socialist Party in the early part of this century. Uh, and one of the reasons I went into that area is that I have a real concern that in terms of the media, uh, we really are, through the mass media in general, and I want to congratulate C-SPAN for being an exception to that rule, I think we don't really get a real glimpse of American reality on the CBSs and the NBCs. And I think when we talk about why we are where we are today as a country, we have candidates for the Democratic and Republican parties never seriously debating, in my view, the real issues facing our country. I think the television and, and the television industry plays a really important part in preventing serious debate about the, the major issues facing our country. I, as a candidate for office, for example, you know that, that when you get on television, you have 30 seconds to articulate your point of view. Uh, you know that you're dependent upon 30-second ads. Uh, and I think it is absolutely imperative if we, if we talk about bringing back a sense of democracy to this country where people don't sit, just sit and watch other people, but feel that this is their, their country and that they can shape it. We've got to make radical changes in the television industry and the demand, demand that they deal with the important issues facing our society. I'd like to add that you have a degree in political science from the University of Chicago and originally from Brooklyn, New York. We'll be taking your calls in just a few moments. The numbers, again, will be listed throughout the show at the bottom of the screen. And again, the 30-day policy. You've called in within the last month. Wait, let's give someone else a chance to get through. At the national level, why a third party? We've touched okay. on it a little bit so Okay, far, let's look at the reality of what's going on right now. We just came through a presidential election. I think it's fair to say, even if people don't hold my own political perspective, that most people were, to say the least, disenchanted with the election. You have a situation where half of the American people didn't bother voting. Okay? We have in the United States today the lowest turnout of any industrialized nation in the entire world. By and large, poor people in the United States no longer vote. You know, we all sit and say, isn't it terrible that in South Africa blacks can't vote? Let's face reality that in the United States the vast majority of poor people don't vote. Why do half the people not vote for president? And in off presidential years, even fewer people vote. State elections, local elections, very few people vote. And I think the reason is that people perceive that government does not represent their interests. What difference does it really make? Michael Dukakis says, my campaign is about competence, not ideology. What he's really saying is, folks, there's not a whole lot of difference between the Democrats and the Republicans. You have a situation in the country today where 1% of the population owns over half of the wealth in this country. The richest 10% own over 83% of the wealth. In the last several years, we had a doubling of billionaires in this country at the same time as you have 3 million people sleeping out in the street. Last year, the chief executive officers of the largest corporations received a 48% increase in their take-home pay. The average American worker receives a 3 or 4%. Okay, 15% of our people have no health insurance. Who is addressing the issues that face the vast majority of our people. I think Congress, in a sense, no longer represents the ordinary people, and Congress is made up of the Democrats and Republicans. You know, people very often were yelling at the Republicans and Reagan, look at the horrible priorities he established, but all the terrible things that he did to the poor people. But they forgot that both houses of the Congress for four out of Reagan's eight years were controlled by the Democrats. So I think you have a bipartisan policy which essentially favors the rich at the expense of working people and the poor people. I think we need to go the direction of Canada, which has a third party, Democratic Socialist Party. We may not win right away, but our job is to bring together workers and poor people, minorities, environmental groups, environmentalists, 
Let's come together, articulate the issues, and I think we're going to make some real progress. First call is from right at home, Burlington, Vermont. Oh, boy. <laughs> You're on the air. Go right ahead. Mr. Sanders. Hello. Uh, I believe that you were introduced as a socialist. I read somewhere that you did not or you do not or you never have belonged to the Socialist Party. Is that correct? That's correct. Have you ever belonged to the Communist Party? No, I haven't. Thank you very much. I think it's an interesting question. Um, I am a socialist. Uh, there are in our country probably a dozen different socialist uh, parties. Uh, none of them have terribly much influence. I happen not to be a member of any. My goal is to see that we start a third party in this country, which represents, as I indicated before, a wide spectrum of people. But I'm not a member of the party. A few years ago, there was a third party formed, and uh, Mr. Anderson ran, yeah. and uh, did okay, I guess. Your comments? Well, Mr. Anderson's third party effort did not impress me as much as Barry Common is on the Citizens Party. Uh, I think Mr. Anderson's effort was essentially, I mean, I, I, I give him credit for going beyond the Democratic and Republican parties, but to my mind, it was a fairly conservative effort. I think Barry Commoner, people uh, in the Citizens Party made a more serious effort about talking to working people, environmentalists, and really challenged the system uh, from a class basis and a real political basis much more profoundly uh, than did Mr. Anderson, who in fact was a Republican congressman. If I Do you think Anderson got more publicity, though? Yes. Oh, yeah. Commoner, Why is that? Well, I think you're raising a very important question, and that is one of the difficulties that one has in terms of developing a third party in this country is dealing with a media which is increasingly dominated by large corporations. Uh, and it is no great secret that uh, large corporations who own the newspapers, who own the television stations, who own the radio stations, are not terribly anxious to give a, a good hearing to viewpoints which challenge their economic interests. Uh, and that's, that's really a basic problem that we're going to have to deal with. I'd like to talk more about that on your particular campaign. But first, let's go out to Seattle, Washington. Go right ahead. Yes, I'm interested in talking to a socialist because it's so hard to find one anymore. And I want to know what you thought of uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson's campaign, whether you agreed with most of those points that he was making. And I want to give you one little footnote that's of some interest, I think. Um, my nieces had uncles on both sides of their families, their mothers and their fathers, named Eugene V, as in Victor. <laughs> right. In Burlington, we had a real debate about our attitude toward Jesse Jackson's campaign. I think many of us were impressed by the positions that Jackson was bringing forth. We were deeply impressed by the concept of the Rainbow Coalition, which I believe is exactly what has to be done in this country. And we were impressed by Jackson's charisma and his going into the ghettos and into the poor areas and speaking for the family farmers who were being thrown off of their land. And that moved us very much. The problem that we had is that, of course, Jackson was functioning within the Democratic Party, and we're not Democrats. So we had a discussion within our own organization, and we ended up saying, yeah, we're not Democrats, but we think what Jackson was doing was so important that we are going to support him. And for one night in Vermont, we did go into the Democratic Party, and in fact, Jackson ended up... Uh, winning the Democratic caucuses. Uh, so I was sympathetic to Jackson. I agree with the concept of the Rainbow Coalition. I do disagree with Jesse in terms of whether the Democratic Party can be the real vehicle for social change. I believe it should be a third party. How would you assess the media coverage of your campaign? Was it fair to you? Yeah. In Vermont, you know, after your mayor for eight years, I think I am not treated differently than other candidates. I'm not going to tell you that I'm, I'm picked on or discriminated against. The problem that I have and I think it's the same problem that any, any serious candidate has, is you can't deal with complex issues in the 24 seconds that you get when somebody sits a microphone in front of you and gives you only a certain amount of time. Now, that's not just my problem. It's George Bush's problem. It's anybody's problem. And the question we had, I know, in my particular campaign, something like 25 debates all around the state. And constantly you were asked to give your view on how you solve the budget deficit in one minute. Well, you know what? You can't do it in one minute. I think, and this is an important point that I want to reiterate, you are not going to have serious discussion of the issues facing this country. You are not going to be able to educate our population. And I have to say that in my view, the American people are significantly less politically conscious and understanding of what goes around them than most of the people around the world. And one of the reasons is the collapse of the media 
in terms of allowing serious people with different points of view to go forward and debate the real issues of our time or even to bring on the television set. Now, for example, we face, as all people know, an ecological crisis in our time, whether it's acid rain, the destruction of the ozone layer, the greenhouse effect. One would think that the CBSs and the NBCs of the world will be doing prime time specials on these programs, having different scientists talking about the issues, involving people in understanding what's going on in terms of our planet. They don't. The function of television is to make as much money as possible for the owners of the television stations and for those people who advertise the 30 second ads on television. So I would say that we're not going to bring about serious political change in this country until we deal with the media, which more and more is being swallowed up by large conglomerates. Very important issue. Let's go to Western Massachusetts. Amherst, you're on the air. Uh, yes, I'd like to first thank C-SPAN for uh, uh, letting me have the opportunity to speak. And I'd just like to let you know that I, it, it's so refreshing to hear someone speak um, to reality. Um, just listening to ABC, CBS, NBC, and the rest of the, the, the stations, you get absolutely nothing. And Mr. Sanders, I support you 100%. Uh, the question that uh, I wanted to ask you is that there's a, uh, uh, an old Marxian concept, which um, I think you might be familiar with. It goes something like this. Those who are not in control of the mental means of production are subject to it. And I think you're exactly right when you, um, you know, look at the corporate interest um, behind uh, ABC, CBS, NBC, and a lot of the other establishment uh, um, news organizations. And um, I just wish you could just elaborate a little bit more uh, on that. But uh, I just support you so much, and it's, it's so nice to, to hear someone speaking to reality. Thank you. Thank you very much. But let me touch on the subject, because, again, it's an issue that I think does not get the type of discussion, certainly on commercial television, needless to say, that it should. What, what is television about on the, on the networks? But let's think about it for a moment. I think no one denies, certainly not the networks themselves, that their function is to make as much money as they can. Now, you stop for a moment, and you turn on the television, you're constantly bombarded with 30-second ads. You talk to teachers, and you say, what does this do to the attention span of the kids. The kids watch television 40, 50 hours a week. What it means is that kids are losing the ability to concentrate because they're constantly being interrupted by moronic ads. You know, we have talking toilet seats and talking kittens and so forth and so on. Your programs are primarily built around the ads themselves. They're built to end at a certain climatic moment and you flip into the 30 second uh, commercial. Television, some people, some people think that television is a hopeless technology, that it can't be reformed. I disagree with that. I think that television has extraordinary potential, but I think that just as we are beginning as a nation to stand up to the polluters who pollute our air and our water and our earth, I think we've got to stand up and say to the television networks, you are transmitting your television via the public airwaves, and you have certain responsibilities. You have got to help educate the people about what's going on. You've got to let political parties and people discuss their points of view. And you can't just use those airwaves to make as much money as possible for yourself. That's an issue that has not been debated anywhere near as seriously as it should, even with the public television network. For example, just look at, at the PBS. How many progressive programs are there on the PBS? You have the right-wing programs from National Review on. You have the mobile oil programs. How many programs come from a left point of view? which ref re reflect the needs of working people and poor, and poor people. Virtually none. So even the PBS, which is ostensibly the public station, is dominated by corporate power. Let's go to California. Monterey, you're on the air. Hello, Mr. Sanders. Hi. Okay, I'm a uh, Vermont, re uh, Vermont resident uh, from down by Rutland who has uh, moved to Monterey via Japan. I spent the last three years in Japan, and especially at the time uh, of the election, and I was, I was disenchanted. Uh, it was like one of those horrible questionnaires where somebody hands you these multiple choice questions and you want to rewrite the questions. I am, uh, I, I am behind you on a third, a viable third party. Hello? Okay. Yes, go right ahead. <laughs> well, that, that's, uh, I'm just, I'm voicing my support. Good. Okay, Thank you thanks. very much. A funny thing happened recently. I wrote uh, an op-ed piece which appeared in the New York Times on January 3rd, 1989. It was very nice of the Times to print it. And I was astounded by the response that this article got. Basically, it said that the Democrats and Republicans are not dealing with the real issues facing working people in terms of environmental protection, 
in terms of raising the minimum wage, in terms of health care, housing, etc., etc. And the letters came in by the dozens and dozens and dozens. And what that response indicates to me that there is out there throughout this country, especially among working people and poor people and, and people concerned about peace and the environment, a tremendous, as this gentleman said, disenchantment with status quo politics. And uh, my hope is, and certainly my hope is, that uh, we're going to go beyond the Democrats and Republicans. Let's go back up Burlington, Vermont. Uh, go right ahead. Uh, yes, sir. A am I on now? Yes, go right ahead. You can talk to your mayor. Well, uh, this is a local issue, uh, and I'm I'm wondering how the mayor can feel justified with a question that's going to be on the ballot in March, uh, subsidizing uh, child care. Good. Now, child care is, is a very important issue all over the country, but my question is, if he could explain to the viewers how how he's comfortable uh, pointing the finger at 49 second-class license holder in the city of Burlington, you know, to subsidize uh, the Burlington share. And, uh, and another uh, follow-up thing is uh, the promotions are downtown Burlington, shop in Burlington, and how he can justify uh, putting on this proposal and still expect people to shop in the city of Burlington. Okay, the gentleman raises, let me explain a little bit, uh, probably the rest of the nation does not know what's going to be on the ballot in Burlington. They will soon. They will <laughs> soon. All right. All of them. <laughs> in Burlington, we have, as exists throughout our state and in fact throughout this nation, as you know, a very serious problem regarding child care. While we spend $300 billion on the military and give tax breaks to corporations and wealthy people, the federal government has been unable to provide any kind of substantial sums of money for child care. So you have all over this country working mothers, families, paying a huge percentage of their income. If you're making 300 bucks a week and you want a kid to go, your kid to go to a decent child care center, it might cost you 80 and 90 bucks. I mean, it's really prohibitive. In honesty, all honesty, the solution should come from the federal government. They have the capabilities of raising revenue in a progressive manner, but they choose to give tax breaks to the rich and spend money on a nuclear weaponry. So we've given up on the federal government. They clearly are not going to do it. That's why some of us are not enamored with the Democrats and Republicans. State government should be doing a lot more in Vermont throughout the nation. Our state government does a little bit, nowhere near enough. But we have a problem. So I think, as mayor of our city, that we've got to address that problem. So what the gentleman is talking about is there is a, an issue that's going before the people of our city, which will enable us to raise a million and a quarter dollars for a child care development fund. Uh, based on an expansion of our gross receipts tax. So he doesn't he also like mentioned it. about shopping. Well, I mean, the theory is, he raises another issue, okay? You see, it, during my eight years as mayor, every time, not every time, almost every time, we have tried to develop progressive taxation. We've done what we thought was right for working people or the elderly people or poor people. Basically, it comes down to who's going to pay. I do not believe in the property tax. I think the property tax in Vermont throughout this nation is a regressive and unfair form of taxation. We have looked for progressive alternatives. Every time we do it, the rich people and the business community says, you're going to drive business out of Burlington, you're a terrible mayor, and so forth and so on. Well, the reality is Burlington right now is one of the lowest unemployment rates in the United States. Our problem is not driving business out. Our problem is now controlling development. But to answer his question, I think increasingly the people who have the money, the business community whose property values are soaring, soaring, who are making very good profits, they're going to have to help us with child care. They're going to have to help us with housing. I'm not going to go to working people and poor people and raise their taxes to pay for these needs. Let's go to Reno, Nevada. Go right ahead. The USSR is an, a perfect example of socialism, and it hasn't gotten anywhere in all these years. Uh, communism is dead. I don't understand how you can apply it to a city. Um, the, let's say, for example, the Speaker of the House, the, Mr. Dowd, uh, Mr. Dellums, these people are socialists, and they are always, just like in Russia, and Mr. Gorbachev saying, the people on top always want to have the best, and they take the profits of the country, like the nomenclatura in the socialist Russia. How can we say Mr. Wright wants everyone to get 50% more money? He is taking the judges 
in the city and giving them from 79,000 to 135,000 so he can control the courts and there'll be no reapportionment for the Republicans. That's the same party will stay in. The difference in socialism to me in the city is like when they took my land, they rezoned it and that way they could keep it. There was no way for me to utilize my land. Is that how you apply it? And can you tell me, how can you tell me, how can you possibly uh, uh, run a country on the basis where the people on top just call themselves socialists, but they're, they're worse than the capitalists because they don't give you freedom. They take what they want and they make the judges and the laws the way they want them. All right, let me just jump okay. in here. Well, I am not aware that the people who run this country, I, ha I haven't been aware lately that Mr. Bush, I didn't see the paper today, but I did not know that Mr. Bush announced that he was a socialist or that many members of the United States Congress have announced that they were socialists or the Supreme Court has announced that they are socialists. I, I don't quite understand the thrust of the country. If, if the woman feels that zoning is socialistic, I disagree with her. Let's go up to North Windham, Maine. Go right ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, on this three-party uh, system, uh, I have a small uh, little statement and then a very quick question. It would appear to me that it's already here, that the people of the United States of America that takes the time to write their congressmen and their senators to stop all pay raises, and they, the uh, representatives, none of them, listen, then I would say the three-party system is already here. Good. Thank you very much, well. and I'll be listening for you. Well, I think with the gentleman, you know, it's a funny, uh, as soon as that business came out, we spoke out about it in Vermont, and, and uh, a lot of people, you know, responded to that. And all over this country now, people uh, cannot believe that a United States Congress, which has not raised the minimum wage in 10 years, which has cut programs for the poor, that these people are going on television saying, gee, we just can't make it with $89,500 plus a lot of very nice benefits. We need a 50% increase. What that is about is the arrogance of power. And it's related to the fact that in the last election, I don't know how many people know this, 99% of the incumbent congressmen were reelected. Okay? In other words, what you're seeing now in the United States Congress is a situation, number one, we have a lot of very, very wealthy people. One third of the United States Senate are millionaires. A lot of the congressmen are millionaires. Number two, when you're an incumbent congressman, you can pick up a lot of corporate PAC support. You have a lot of name recognition. You have franking privileges. You're on TV every day. Basically, you're seeing the creation of a government which is isolated and unaccountable to the people and apparently cannot be recalled by the people. There was a bigger turnover in the Politburo in the Soviet Union last year than in the United States Congress. Now that's a real problem. And the arrogance went that far as to say to the American people, you average worker who saw a three or four percent increase in your salary, you're making twenty or thirty thousand bucks if you're lucky. We we only make an eighty nine thousand, we're gonna get a fifty percent increase in our salaries. Now, in fact, as that gentleman has indicated, maybe the Congress went a little bit too far this time. And people, as a result of work of people like Ralph Bader and many others, there's been a real citizen's uprising against that. And if that helps lead to a third party, demonstrating the arrogance of Congress, certainly I'll be very happy about that. Let's go to San Francisco for our next call. Hi, how are you? Okay. I'd just like to say, go for it, Mr. Sanders. Uh, we're people, you have no idea how many people are with you on this one. I would just like to say, well, I would like to ask you, um, is there some way you can enunciate a plan of action uh, for people to go after this? I mean, there is a strong need, there is a strong desire in the American body politic for a third party. Okay. Uh, what is it that we can do? Okay. What, what can I do? Who do I get in contact with? Well, here's the point. First of all, I don't think that there are any magical solutions. We all understand that it's a lot more difficult to actually bring about a strong third party than it is to simply talk about it. But one of the things that we can do, there are a couple of things that we can do. There is a group in New York City that I'm affiliated with called the National Committee for Independent Political Action and CIPA. Some really very fine people who are already beginning that process of developing uh, independent political action. That's number one. Number two, probably more importantly, I think it is idealistic and mythical to believe that you're going to bring people together and start a national third party like that. You know, snap your fingers. I think that what has got to happen is in community after community all over this country, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, in Vermont, start standing up, bringing people together. Don't keep voting for the lesser of two evils. Articulate what the real issues are. And the issues are very clear. We're building expensive housing, but no housing for middle-income people or poor people. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. 
The priorities of the national government are totally absurd. More and more money for military spending, less for human needs. We're becoming less and less of a democratic nation. Let's deal with corporate control over the media. The issues are really there. What we need is the guts to stand up to the ruling class and the big money interest who dominate the cities and the towns and the states of Vermont, of the nation, and in Vermont too. And I think what has to happen is a party develops in San Francisco, a party develops in LA, a party develops in Boston. Let's move, and when we get the grassroots moving, then we come together. So I think we do it from down and then go to the top rather than the other way. Go down to Panama City, Florida. Go right ahead. Uh, yes, I'd just like to address um, generally everything he said. Um, frankly, he's right, you know, that um, America is in bad shape right now. Um, we have people sleeping on the street. We have a lot of things that are just not very just. But um, we can handle that in the um, framework that we have now. It's good that we have choices and we can have uh, him on the air and anybody else on the air. But I think our biggest problem right now is not who we elect, but who we respect. And the problem in America is that we have lost respect for the true history of America and where we really came from and why we were really formed. See, this country was formed on freedom to worship God, and we've lost that. But if we haven't lost it, we've given it up. But right now, we still have choices. Uh, we're on the verge of losing them uh, because God tells me that every day we should cherish the fact that we have choices. All right, thank you very much, Panama City. I'd like to just jump in. Okay. Let's go out to Kenmore, Washington. You're on the air. Thank you very much, C-SPAN. Congratulations for having this gentleman on so we can expose him. But it seems that uh, what the people have to realize is that, that we can be fooled. You know, we've been fooled many, more, many times. By, well, even Castro said he was not a communist, but we found out later that that was different. But the thing is, for socialism, whether it's Nazi socialism or communist socialism, for that to exist, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution of the United States have to be done away with. And uh, we know what socialism is. It's ruled by the few chosen few in the government forevermore. We found that out. We know what that is. So I can't see why uh, next, uh, why we should not have a, some of the uh, Nazi uh, socialists up here now that we have a communist socialist. But well, yeah, I mean, I'm glad that he, he raises the question. And this has to do with an extraordinary ignorance in this country in terms of the difference between communism and socialism. Right? Socialism is not communism. The Soviet Union has been, for many, many years, for decades, an authoritarian society. Many of us are hopeful that at the present moment some of those authoritarian uh, structures are being broken down, and we hope that that continues, and we hope that democracy comes to the Soviet Union. It is not a democratic society. But what people like this gentleman do not know is, for example, that in Scandinavia, in Sweden, you've had socialist governments for decades, that in fact that country is probably in most respects more democratic than the United States. They have 80 or 90 percent of the people voting. They have strong labor unions. They have a more open media. They have a health care system guaranteeing health care to all of the people. Not to say that that's a utopia, but to say in Canada, north of us, you have two provinces which have been governed by uh, uh, socialist type uh, governments. So to equate socialism with communism is simply ignorance, and I'm afraid that too much of that ignorance exists in our own country. At various times, the governments of Nicaragua and previous, the previous government of Grenada have said that they were not communist, they That's were right. socialist, Marxist. Yeah. How do you relate to that? that? I agree with that. You know, what they said, what the government of Grenada said, uh, under Maurice Bishop, is that they wanted to forge their own way, and they were overthrown by the United States government. In Nicaragua, you have a government which has came to power and I believe has tried to do the right things for its people in terms of health care, land reform, education. If you trace the history of the United States vis-a-vis -vis Latin America and Central America, there has never been a time when a country made a revolution for the poor people where it was not overthrown by the CIA or the United States government or the Marines. Salvador Allende was democratically elected by the people of Chile. He made the mistake of believing that his job as president of that country was to represent the people of, of Chile. And he did his best, and he was overthrown by the CIA. So the interesting question is why 
does the United States government think, whether it's Nicaragua or any other country in Latin or Central America, that it has the right to overthrow those governments? Let's go down to Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Go right ahead. You're on the air. Mayor Sanders. Hello. We agree with you uh, about what you're saying about corporate control of the media. That's uh, obviously a serious problem because we're not educating the people to the problems. But one of the bigger problems that we see is that there doesn't seem to be, in the economic world, a level playing field. We have practices like uh, retained earnings by corporations, but we've completely done away with any semblance of that in the private and individual sector, for example, IRAs and things of that nature. The individual pays his taxes up front before he gets his paycheck. The corporation does not pay its taxes if it puts it in a retained earnings account ever. That's not double taxation. What would you say about changing that provision and a few similar provisions in the IRS to level the economic playing field? Maybe that's the problem, not a class struggle. Well, I would say that that problem is a reflection of the class struggle because it is not an accident that those types of breaks are given to large and powerful corporations. It's not an accident that during the last eight years we have given hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks to huge corporations at the same time that poor people through sales taxes and property taxes have had to pay more. It is not an accident that you have companies like Philip Morris that are able to buy out Kraft for $12 billion. I think it's a mistake to separate economics from politics. In my view, the Congress is very heavily dominated by corporate power and the corporate tax, and by and large, they do the, the work of the corporations. For example, I mean, as I think most people know, uh, Ronald Reagan was an actor in California, and this is no great secret, nothing that I discovered, and some millionaires in California said, Ron, we want you to work for us. We want you to become governor. And they sat around the table, and there was a dozen millionaires. They made him governor, and then they made him president. And he did his job effectively for those corporations. General Electric, for whom he worked for a number of years before he became a governor and president, over a period of years during his presidency, paid nothing in federal taxes. So I think the federal tax situation needs a radical revision So in, 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 in moving toward a progressive tax system where you ask those individuals and institutions to start paying their fair share so that you don't squeeze the middle-income people or working people. Let's go to Portland, Oregon. You're on C-SPAN. Yes, hello. hello. Uh, I want to say, first of all, C-SPAN, how very pleased I am to hear this gentleman. Uh, I listen to a lot of uh, public uh, affairs programs, Capital Gang, Crossfire, Evans, and Novak, all are to the extreme capitalists, right? They're absolutely sickening. And uh, we need to uh, get more informed Americans by programs such as this. Now, um, I know that you stay a long ways away from the, uh, you shy away from anyone suggesting uh, communism, and a lot of people think socialism is very much the same, but um, uh, they're always saying that communism, and they mean socialism very much, doesn't work anywhere, but I say that our country is not working very well. Here in Portland, Oregon, we have to forego many things that would make our city more beautiful, more livable, and would create better living conditions because of crime and violence. It seems to me that if America can't handle the problems of crime, drugs, and violence, something is wrong, and that socialist countries do not have the problem. Even in, in Soviet Russia, they do not have it. All right, thank you very much, Portland. But let me, let me touch on that. I don't think there's a magic answer to the crime problem, which is a serious problem not only in Portland, but all over the country. But clearly, what we do understand is there is a growing underclass in the United States of America. People who don't feel part of society, don't respect society, they are down below, they have no place to go. To those kids, doing drug deals and making a quick buck is a good thing. Those kids are not going to graduate high school. You have areas in America where 75% the of the kids don't graduate high school. I think we can argue about what socialism means. And let me tell you, to be very frank, I don't have a blueprint in my pocket. I don't think there is one. All that I think we have got to begin to say is it doesn't make sense. When this woman talked about crime, and crime is very often related to drugs, and drugs is related to hopelessness, no sane person destroys their body if they believe that they have a future in their lives. And what the drug problem means to me is that you've got millions of people, primarily young people, who believe they ain't going no place, and they may as well shoot up right now. And they're dying, 
they're committing crimes, they get the money to deal with those drugs. And what we as a nation have got to do is say, is it acceptable that you have a society which has people with billions and billions of dollars in wealth, corporations making huge profits, not paying a nickel in taxes, and yet you have educational systems throughout this country falling apart and not providing what these kids need, housing needs that are grossly unmet. Is the priority system in this country a rational one? And I think the answer is no. Now, we can argue what socialism means to a blue in the face, but I think for a start, what I believe is that this country has the wealth, the guarantee, a decent education to every child in this country, free education through college, if that child has the ability. We have the capabilities of providing a national health care system which guarantee you all of the health care that you need without out-of-pocket expenses, and we have the capability of providing every American with decent, affordable housing. Okay? I don't believe that every American has got to make $28,422 and wear the same suits you know, and march in the same way. That's, that's ridiculous. But I do think that we can do it, and this woman raises the crime problem. If you give people hope, if you address housing problems, economic problems, educational problems, you're going to go a long way to cutting the drug problem, and you're going to make this a far more civilized society. Bernard Sanders of Burlington, Vermont, Socialist Mayor. Thanks very much for being with us. My pleasure. And thank you for your calls, and have a good weekend. Good night.